President Obama unveils proposals to reform U.S. gun laws following last month's mass school shooting in Connecticut. Do they go far enough? And will he get them through Congress? And as French military action continues in Mali, what role should the U.S. play? You're watching Inside Story Americas from Washington. Hello, I'm Shihab Ritansi. December's mass shooting at a school in Newtown, Connecticut, left 20 children and six teachers dead. It also ignited a national debate about the country's relationship with guns. On Wednesday, President Obama unveiled a series of proposals, including a ban on assault weapons, high-capacity magazines, and the introduction of more background checks on gun buyers. Here's what he had to say. That most fundamental set of rights to life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness, fundamental rights that, that were denied to college students at Virginia Tech and high school students at Columbine and elementary school students in Newtown and kids on street corners in Chicago on too frequent a basis to tolerate. And all the families who've never imagined that they'd lose a loved one to a bullet. Those rights are at stake. We're responsible. Joining me to discuss the proposals is Christian Heine from the Coalition to Stop Gun Violence. It's interesting, when you look at the actual executive actions that he signed, perhaps by de design, they're not that radical. I mean, they're expanding existing programs and so forth. But what did, what did today symbolize, I suppose, is the question. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, I, as I said before on this on this program, you know, I'm a victim of gun violence myself, and, and that's how I got in this movement. And uh, you know, a day like today is a day that that so many of us never thought that we'd see. Um, it's been very moving, and I think if anything, he's just let us know going into his inauguration for his second term that this is something that he's going to take on, and is going to be a priority. And he's not going to back away from until we make until we make our schools safer, until we make our streets safer, and, and until we can do what we can to to try to save the lives of, of Americans. But there's still a great deal of pessimism that the more substantive uh, laws that he wants passed will be passed. Yeah, there's a lot of work to be done, um, and it's certainly on the shoulders of us now. We have the leadership, we have the voice, and now it's it's time to us for the American people to kind of speak up and, and make sure that we can get things done. I think the things that we've got in our court that are going to make that more of a possibility is the fact that, that as the president said, this, a lot of the stuff that is being proposed in Congress is strongly supported by gun owners and NRA members alike. 90% of all Americans, 81% of gun owners, and 74% and of NRA members support universal background checks. There's nothing that's going to reduce uh, the, the amount of murders that we see every day in our streets, the 33 people that are murdered every day with guns, than fixing that background check system. Actually, we should quickly run through some of the proposals uh, on gun control. Uh, th that Congress take a series of actions, among them the introduction of criminal background checks on all gun sales, the renewal of the ban on military assault weapons, a ban on high-capacity magazines, and armor-piercing ammunition. President Obama also signed those 23 executive orders. Some of them make it easier for states to share relevant information, require more research into the causes and prevention of gun violence, launch a responsible gun ownership campaign, and require federal authorities to trace the origin of guns recovered in criminal investigations. And as you say, some of those don't seem that controversial. And yet the leadership of the National Rifle Association is against some of them. And they've launched a new campaign today, in fact, and here's a portion of their, one of their adverts. Are the president's kids more important than yours? Then why is he skeptical about putting armed security in our schools when his kids are protected by armed guards at their school? Mr. Obama demands... So this was released and then withdrawn, interestingly, by the NRA. I mean, I says that's quite interesting, too. I mean, you wonder whether these, these, these messages are, are actually working for them. I mean, I think that the NRA is having a real hard time trying to keep up with where exactly they want to stand in this fight. As we were talking about earlier, I mean, I mean, they're so the leadership is so far disassociated from their membership right now that that they're trying to find their place in all this, and they don't exactly know what they want to do. Having said that, though, amongst the executive actions was precisely what the NRA were calling for. Their number eighteen 
provide incentives for schools to hire school resource officers. That's armed guards, actually. There, so he is accepting that that we need more armed guards in schools, which actually everyone was kind of guffawing at just a few weeks ago. Yeah, I think you'll hear a couple different things though that they're talking about too. I mean, they're talking about armed guards, and when you're talking about there, you're talking about um, you know individuals that are highly trained that have to renew their training, have to do a lot of things that have uh, requirements to make sure that they're profit proficient in using the guns that they have. Uh, that being said, I mean, they're continually asking to arm teachers and arm students and arm classrooms and, and against the advise, uh, advisement of, of, you know, the AFT, uh, the, the NEA, um, a number of these organizations that say that the classroom is not a place for guns. But then again, this, again this, uh, there is this re recommendation for more s SROs, which are, again, armed guards. There is this, 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 this concern of, for those who have nothing to do with the NRA, right. that this is the sort of thing that criminalizes people further. There are these high-profile shootings in affluent white suburbs, which catch the attention. But as far as gun crime is concerned and gun homicide, it's black and Latino inner city areas. This sort of stuff is just going to criminalize people further, give uh, the, the authorities even more of a way to split up communities put more people in jail without addressing the causes of crime. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think what we're really seeing is, is we're finally giving back, uh, uh, not just to the conversation about what can be done to kind of prevent the flow of illegal guns onto our streets, but we're really, what the president's trying to do is, is create a system in which uh, a bureau, like the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and Explosives give them back leadership give them back the means to exactly see how these illegal guns are getting onto the market and, how, and what we can do to stop that flow of illegal guns. Uh, there's nothing aside from that and background checks that's going to save American lives and, and lower that 33 people that are murdered every day. I myself, you know, mine was But the not social the, causes are being ignored and the fear is then that people will just be more criminalized where gun violence yeah. is at its worst. I'm right? not exactly sure if they're, if they're being ignored. I think that it's hard to, to in executive orders, do a single thing that's going to stop gun but violence in, in Congress, from stopping. I suppose, yeah. Exactly, yeah. but, but, but I, think, I think trying to make sure that we are, are stopping these dangerous people who we already have federal prohibitions on uh, from acquiring weapons, making sure that the guns aren't getting in the hands of those individuals is a phenomenal first step in a long line of things that we need to do to address gun violence. Christian Heine, it's an immensely uh, complex topic. Thank you it so is. much. And in fact, we're going to look into some of those uh, difficult ideas surrounding gun control on a special series on Inside Story America is coming up. We'll look at President Obama's gun plan in much more detail in our upcoming series. We'll examine America's gun culture, the politics of guns and gun violence in U.S. inner cities in three special editions. That's coming up at the end of this month. Now to Mali, where French troops have begun engaging in direct ground combat against fighters from Ansar al-Din and other rebel groups. Although there have been uprisings in Mali since the 1960s, when members of the Tuareg community in the north began an insurgency, the Western intervention in Libya was the spark for the latest intensification of fighting. Colonel Gaddafi relied on members of the Tuareg as a fighting force. And as the regime disintegrated, many fled to join their long marginalized communities in Mali. Before long, a new uprising had displaced the Malian army from the north of the country. The secular Tuareg were joined by the Al-Qaeda-linked Tuareg group Ansar al-Din, as well as other Islamic groups. And last year, it was these religious factions that seized control of the north and proceeded to govern with brutality. France's intervention follows years of efforts by the U.S. to prevent the spread of Al-Qaeda-influenced groups. It's reported that the U.S. has spent up to $600 million in the region. Yet for all that money, its allies were powerless to stop the advance off Al-Qaeda-linked fighters. In fact, in the South, it was recipients of U.S. aid who took advantage of the Northern fighting to overthrow the democratically elected government. And in the North, many of the government's U.S.-funded military units joined the rebellion. The U.S. is providing surveillance and intelligence support to France, but says it has not provided any direct military backing. I'm joined from Philadelphia by Susanna Wing, an expert on Malian politics who teaches at Haverford College. Here in the studio, Rudolf Atala, former Africa counterterrorism director at the Department of Defense, and Nia Quetta, an independent Africa policy analyst. Nee, you've long argued against Western intervention in Africa. You're hugely suspicious about um, what motivates the U.S. and others. Yes. And yet you're in favor of this French action. Why? Give us a progressive case for Western military intervention in Mali. Because it seems to me that the, progressive, the core of progressive uh, uh, um, uh, position is protecting vulnerable people. Okay, 
And if you look at what has happened to ordinary Malians, especially in the north, for the past many months, almost a year, I think, and, and so the people in northern Mali have been suffering, number one. Number two, it's only going to get worse. If, if the uh, uh, militants take over Bamako, I think what we have seen for the last year will be child's play in terms of the repercussions both in Mali and in West Africa. So I think, in fact, we should have had properly planned international intervention. I do blame the U.S. for dragging its feet in the U.N. So the French intervention, I support it only because I think where we are today, they went in last Friday. As of last Thursday, where we were is simply um, such a bad situation that the French are the least bad option. But so we shouldn't look at this as just another self-serving um, Western hegemonic assault on Africa to protect its resources that will escalate the violence in ways that the architects in Paris and Washington can't even dream of right now. I really can't say that all that could happen. So it breaks my heart, but I do think that it's only because if we did nothing, the options will be worse. They will have all the motivations that we are usually suspicious of. But it also happens that with the African involvement, and if things go properly, this is the only chance Mali has of stabilizing the country and protecting itself. Because again, my key point is, if nothing is done, if we say because the West has such a bad record, and France and the US, we should sit on our hands and do nothing, all of West Africa will be in flames. Susanna Wing, I mean, there is this unease uh, amongst critics of Western foreign policy about this intervention. But there is this case that it's all very well to sit in Washington or, or, you know, in comfort and say, well, you know, the locals just have to make peace with Al Qaeda. Um, there's nothing we can do because, let's face it, the West are even worse quite often as when it comes to exploiting Africa. Yeah, and I think what, what really needs to be stated is that um, the French, sim somebody simply had to act because last week when Islamist groups made an advance, they were, they were making an offensive, took over a town of Kona, and were advancing towards a major military airstrip in, uh, in Severe. And so this was a crucial moment, and, and had the French not acted, um, the Malian military had no way to prevent this advance. So so uh, I, I think we shouldn't forget that uh, Malians, most Malians are very enthusiastic about this intervention, have been hoping and pleading for it for some time. So, um, you know, it, it is definitely an unsettling position for those of us who are not keen on military interventions. But, but given the events of last week, uh, this was a, an essential move, I think. But how does the West look at this, Rudolph, and are, and these, are there differences? Uh, between France and the U.S. and others then? Sure. I mean, France took a unilateral step forward. Uh, great. Stopping the Islamists, great. However, there are several things that, that need to be factored in that I, I have not seen. One, they're creating space for an intervention force. Who's going to pay for that intervention force and how long? Amongst the people of the north, primarily the Tuareg, who've been displaced in refugee camps in neighboring countries, there's a major concern that now Mali gets the upper hand. All of a sudden, they, became, they, they, they start indiscriminate killing of Tuareg, right. which is part of their concern. Who are the West fighting on behalf of? Is the point so, the so it, well, the, the West sees the northern problem as a purely al-Qaeda problem. Unfortunately, Mali itself does not see it as an al-Qaeda problem. They see it as a Tuareg problem. So the understanding of the problem set is, is, is vastly different between core people within the Mali military and in, in the West. And that needs to be settled in, a, in, a, in itself. Well, we'll get on to the long-term implications in a moment. But this is what Carter Ham, the, the head of AFRICOM, um, the, the, the US African command, had to say about Malian intervention a few months ago. He said, as each day goes by, Al-Qaeda and other organizations are strengthening their hold in northern Mali. So there is a compelling need for the international community, led by Africans, to address that. Negotiation is the best way. Military intervention may be a necessary component. But if there is to be a military intervention, it has to be successful. It cannot be done prematurely. If there was an undertaking of a military endeavor today, and this is only a few months ago, my sense is that from a tactical assessment, it would be unsuccessful and it would set back the conditions even further than they are today. I mean, that's the point there. Even AFRICOM, um, who can't help but have noticed, you know, that, that through their prism of the war on terror, the spread of, uh, of uh, Salafists, 
and can't have helped but notice but how, how minerally rich Mali mm. is and its neighbors, that they weren't necessarily prepared for asymmetrical warfare in the sand dunes. And, and this is the thing with, the, with you know, respectfully to France, I, I'm, I'm glad they're in the fight. However, this is not, not a force on force. This is an insurgency war that we're, that we're fighting. You have to be prepared for The Islamists, for the longest time now, have been preparing towns of Gao, of Timbuktu, of, of, of Kidal to be an area where if an intervention force were to come, they've already dug themselves outside of these towns to carry an insurgency. This has to be, and plus they've also brought a lot of child soldiers that they've paid off and, and integrated. What, what are the rules of engagement when you go up against a 12-year-old that's brandishing a weapon that really doesn't want to be there? Nia Quetta, you're very positive about Paris. They talk about wiping out the rebels. Um, what does that mean in the long term? Where, where do they stop? What, are they, what, are, what sort of war are we talking about here? This is, again, asymmetric warfare. You know, um, um, a reluctant smile came to my face because you said very positive. No, the French intervention worries me, but I do think that there was really no other option. For instance, negotiations. I mean, look, since the UN passed resolution 2085, all the groups in the north, the military, um, the militias, the extremists, they said, okay, we want to talk. We will, we will be on good behavior. What did they do? They destroyed more shrines, and they went all the way into the south, uh, you know, closing in on Mopti. So you cannot take them at their words. They wanted to take over all of Mali before uh, uh, time passes. So I think the French intervention is dangerous, and it is risky, but it is the best option we have. Uh, because you can't leave them in charge of Mali. And all the Malians, all the West Africans, all the ECOWAS, all of Africa Union are saying, this is what we've been asking for. If I have any criticism, it's because the world didn't take it seriously. They took so long. There, right. I know people who are saying, this is not Afghanistan, it's none of our business. It is our business. The U.S. had a role in getting Mali to where it is. Susanna Wayne, can you, um, from what we've heard from Paris, though, did you... Um think that their goals and the sort of rhetoric we're hearing, do, do they fill you with optimism and confidence about this campaign in the long term? Uh, no, I'm not. I, I would say optimism and comfort, uh, certainly not. I think that uh, my understanding is that there is combat going on right now in the streets of Jabali. I think that uh, in, in Western Mali, I think, you know, there may have been a sense that this could have been taken care of with airstrikes, but clearly that's not the case. Mm -hmm. um, yep. And I and I, I would like to kind of go back to the, the point made about about this being a Tuareg problem, because I think, I think that's really important important to understand that Absolutely. it began as really a Tuareg separatist issue, but now it's really both. It, it's both a Tuareg problem and Ansardin is led by Iagala Agali, who is a former Tuareg rebel himself, going back uh, many years. So, but you have this religious fight going on at the same time that you also have the secular hope for uh, Tuareg state in the north and the south saying absolutely no change to the territory. But, but traditionally, this, this the U.S. Country. and its allies haven't been terribly good at dis discerning who are the secular and who are the, you know, and, and who are the religious. Uh, certainly in the, in the north, I suppose. I mean, isn't that the problem? What what is the end game? Even isn't this just back to having the south in charge? What happens to the Tuareg if the French are victorious? Frankly. Well, well, that's a that's a very good question, and I think that um, you know there's been talk about maybe the the French are going to work with the MNLA. The MNLA is trying to yes. position itself in a way to say we can help you fight against these terrorists. Now, the idea of the Malian army working side by side with the the Tuareg separatists is is a little bit um, you know unbelievable. Uh, but the French are clearly that that's on people's minds. All but right. I, the point made about about Tuareg being targeted uh, is a good one, and, and, and I think that we should be aware that that can actually happen. Let's return to the U.S.'s uh, role then. Um, what are they going to do now? And of course now we hear hostages have been taken. I don't know whether yep, that yeah, has some sort of impact. Yep. Uh, but, I mean, do they now go in? So I, I think in, from the U.S. perspective, there are a couple of things that can be done. In, in important. One, in the fight on terrorism, Panetta has said that we, we will chase al-Qaeda wherever they're at. And, and this is part of the equation. Taking out core AQIM leadership is important, but also it's important also to, to separate core MNLA from Ansar Dean. They are not the same. One side is radical on AQIM. I would say Iyad Aghali and Ansar Dean are pure AQIM 
through and through, even if they call themselves uncertain. But you do think that. I mean, there was a sense that, in some ways, one of the reasons why they weren't too concerned, I mean, they were concerned, but not to, for intervention, is because they recognized that these are very local. Many of these were, you know, perhaps Ansar al-Din had more, local, more of a local agenda than AQIM, so that perhaps they weren't as concerned. Whereas the French are very concerned because local means everything because it's all about their uranium for their nuclear plants. Well, it's kidding that they have seven, seven hostages in the, in the north. The French have had them for, for, for a long time. Uh, the French, yes, have concern over, over potential blowback on the uranium reserves in, in Niger. They're, they're concerned about the 6,000 French citizens in Bamako. There are several areas, but also the destabilization that it brings into the region. Uh, for the U.S., it's equally as important. However, you know, with Libya, with Syria, with all these other things, and in a transition phase for the United States, it's just a matter of putting priorities in, in perspective. But isn't there also recognition, perhaps, in the U.S. that they've completely failed in, in the Sahel and the Trans-Sahara partnership? I mean, they have millions of dollars, and they were played like fools well, in let some me, ways let by, me put by the, by the Malian of government, amongst others, who perhaps had relations with al-Qaeda al al and Ansar yeah. al-Din and were using the money just to, to exploit the Tuaregs. No, let, let, me, let me put that in, in context. So initially, back in 2003, when, when uh, Alpara took 32 European hostages into the Sahel. The U.S. military built the Pan-Sahel Initiative, or PSI, to, to, to deal with, pan, with, uh, with Sahelian states in order to drive out Alpara, and that was a success story. If I might, mm -hmm. I think the reason they failed, because the, the, in my view, the strategy was uh, too militaristic. Right. They should have worked with these involved countries to say, look, you have domestic problems of your own. Right. We need to take care of them. And they never help do that. You. They never do we that. We only have three minutes. Long term, can't you see this turning into just another... Yemen, another North Waziristan. The, the, the U.S. will then go back to an idea of, okay, we don't want to get involved. It'll just turn into covert operations. It'll be drone strikes. Uh, areas of the North will just be terrorized you know, by drones in the skies all the it, time. It'll be extrajudicial all, killing. All, all that could happen. On the other hand, it is not destined to happen. There, there are, you know, glimmers of hope. And one area of hope is to give central role to the Malians and the West Africans. You know, Nigerian troops are going, Chadian troops are going. If, I mean, the West Africans and the Africans want to own this. Um, and make sure that you reconstitute Mali. Even the Tuareg problem, I mean, I have a slightly different view. You don't use arms to slice off a country because the Tuaregs are not the only community in the north. You have to establish government authority and then you negotiate for everything. You want we a complex can... approach in, the, in an era of the war on terror when complexity is simply, I mean, this, the prism is simply, let's get the Islamists once we're in there. It's not necessarily about equitable development. You don't think the French are going to ask for a price for this, for this intervention? I too? do worry about that, which is why I am actually. They want democracy or do they want to protect the natural resources and exploit them? Now, now, that's the one question I can't answer. I fear that they may look after the interest. But you see, this is why I think up until now, the U.S. has, as bad as sometimes is Africa policy, it's, it has been far better than the French, which is why I worry that they sat on their hands, they slow everything down in the U.N. and allow the French to take the lead. If you look at U.S. Africa policy, there are communities here who would hold any American government's feet to the fire to make sure that the policy is good. I don't see that in France. So I wish that the U.S. had actually looked at it from an enlightened policy point of view and taking a better lead, especially because he trained Sanogo and he did a number of things that contributed the, the, the to coup, it. The coup leader. Yes. Uh, Susanna Wing, how does the U.S. look at money? I mean, surely it hasn't ex escaped AFRICOM's notice how rich in resources it is. And, and let's face it, AFRICOM was cooked up at the Right Wing Heritage Foundation here in Washington simply, I mean, in, in a nutshell, to be about oil terrorism in China. I mean, that, that's how... That, it looks at Africa. I mean, surely, doesn't that enter into their equations? Well, I think, I think um, you know, certainly, um, you know, AFRICOM and, and it, it, you know, there's, it may enter into the equation a little bit. I think, I think we, should, uh, we should recognize the fact that the U.S. has been calling um, for uh, democracy and for elections. And, and I think that, that some of this, what may be seen as stalling on the part of the U.S. government, is are, are legitimate uh, things that, that are being called for. If, if the South doesn't get its politics straight, then Absolutely. no matter what goes on in the North, nothing's going to be stable for very long. Okay, well, very quick. We've only got 10 seconds, Rudolph. I mean, you have the experience mm -hmm. of this administration, of administrations, rather. Right. Do they have the wherewithal to deal with this complexity? Yes, absolutely. It's, it's, it's just, uh, it, we just need the State Department to, to start pushing in on, uh, in, in Bamako a little bit harder. And I think uh, AFRICOM has got some ideas on how to deal with the threat 
and, and how to deal with it in a, in a bigger term. Um, Nia Quetta, thank you very much. Rudolf Otella, thank you. Susanna Wing, thank you. That's all from the team in Washington, D.C. for now.